take your Bibles again this morning, the book of Acts, Acts and chapter 23. And once you've found your place at Acts 23 and verse 11, I'm going to invite you to stand up again with your Bibles and we'll read God's word together standing. So please stand. <clears throat> I invite you to give attention to the words of the one only living and true God in Acts 23. But on the following night, the Lord stood near him and said, Be courageous, for as you have testified to the truth about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify in Rome also. And when it was day, the Jews formed a conspiracy and put themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who formed this plot. They came to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have put ourselves under an oath to taste nothing until we have killed Paul. Now, therefore, you and the council notify the commander to bring him down to you as though you were going to investigate his case more thoroughly. And as for us, we are ready to kill him before he comes near the place. But the son of Paul's sister heard about their ambush, and he came and entered the barracks and told Paul, and Paul called one of the centurions to himself and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to report to him. So he took him and led him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called me over to him and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took him by the hand and stepping aside began to inquire of him privately, What is it that you have to report to me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down tomorrow to the council as though they were going to inquire somewhat more thoroughly about him. So do not listen to them, for more than 40 of them are hiding in an ambush, sorry, hiding to ambush him. And these men have put themselves under an oath not to eat or drink until they kill him. And now they are ready to, and waiting for assurance from you. Then the commander let the young man go, instructing him, Tell no one that you have noticed, notified me of these things. And he called to him two of the centurions and said, Get 200 soldiers ready by the third hour of the night to proceed to Caesarea with 70 horsemen and with 200 spearmen. They were also to provide mounts to put Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter with the following content. Claudius Lysias to the most excellent governor, Phoenix, Felix, greetings. When this man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them, I came up to them with the troops and rescued him after learning that he was a Roman and wanting to ascertain the basis for the charges they were bringing against him, I brought him down to their council and I found that he was being accused regarding questions in their law but was not charged with anything deserving death or imprisonment. When I was informed that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once also instructing his accusers to bring charges against him before you. So the soldiers, in accordance with their orders, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipress. But on the next day, they let him, sorry, but the next day, they let the horsemen go on with him and they returned to the barracks. When these horsemen had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. And when he had read it, he also asked from what province Paul was, and when he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive as well, giving orders for Paul to be kept in Herod's praetorium. Let's pray quickly before we go to God's word. Loving Father, again, we give thanks for your word. And Father, we simply ask you for help this morning. Help, O oh God, as I would preach its content Help us all, O oh God, to listen to what you would say to us. Father, open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word. Open our, the eyes of our heart to greater faith, to see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him. Lord, we ask you for help in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Please have a seat. I want us to notice the wider context for our text and the section we're in, the book of Acts. If you go right back to the very beginning, first of all, the Lord's program for his gospel witness throughout the whole earth is in Acts 1 and verse 8, which Andrew Walkington brought a great message on uh, last Sunday night. 
And, he, and the Lord said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you should be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth, which would be thought of as Rome in those days. In Acts chapter 12, 1 to 12, Peter leads the early church to the Jews, uh, early ministry to the Jews in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And secondly, in Acts 9 verse 15, Paul's called from persecuting Christ and his church to preaching Christ and planting churches. He was indeed God's chosen instrument to bear Jesus' name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Thirdly, Luke records Paul's desire and purpose in the Spirit to go to Rome in Acts 19 and verse 21. Uh, Paul purposed in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. Fourthly, Paul's letter to the Romans was written before he arrived in Jerusalem, and in that he says in chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, for I long to see you, the Romans, so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each by the other's faith. At the end of the letter, in Romans 15, verses 23 and 24, he writes, I have had for many years a longing to come to you, to come to Rome. And there in Acts 21, <clears throat> we see Paul. He's in Jerusalem, in the temple. He's minding his own business. The Asian Jewish troublemakers see him, assume he has brought Gentiles into the inner court with him, which he hasn't, but they accuse him of teaching against the people, the law, and the temple. And a riot starts. They drag him out of the temple, and they, the Jews, begin to beat him up. And the Romans, Claudius Lysias, see him, and they come, and they intervene, and carry Paul to the barrack steps. And in Acts 22, Paul explains himself to the Jews on the barrack steps. He declares that he has his being sent by God to the Gentiles with the gospel, and the riot resumes again. Everybody gets upset. Acts 23, 1 to 10, the next day, Paul makes another defense before the Romans and the Jews inside the barracks, highlighting these points. <clears throat> His clean, clear conscience before God, the high priest's utter hypocrisy, Paul calling him a whitewashed wall, those two are in stark contrast to each other. And he finishes his, his address by declaring his hope and resurrection of the dead, which also ends in a great dissension. Everybody's arguing. The Sadducees and Pharisees are fighting over Paul's statements, over Paul's declarations. And Paul, again, is rescued by the Romans and safeguarded inside the barracks. That's possible in uh, 2 Timothy 4.16 these words refer to this event. And Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 16, saying, At my first offense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. <clears throat> so we have Acts 23 and verse 10. Paul is isolated and alone in the Roman barracks. No friends, no family, no Jewish counterparts. He's by himself. And no doubt as he's sitting there and, and thinking about what's happened in the last couple of days, what happened? 20 plus years of faithful gospel ministry, three successful missionary journeys, thousands of miles traveled on foot mostly, hundreds of hours of reasoning and explaining and preaching and teaching that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the hope of Israel, the way, the truth, and the life. Disciples have been made and baptized. Churches have been planted and established. Elders appointed. Letters of inspired scripture have been written, including Galatians and Thessalonians and Corinthians and Romans. He has great plans still to travel where the gospel has not been preached, including Spain, passing through Rome to get there. His kind and loving plan to bring a fellowship gift of money from the Christian Gentiles to the Christian Jews has ended in riots, beating, arrest, almost being scourged, and house arrest. If I count correctly, three times he's picked up and carried by the Romans. And where were all the Christian Jews in Jerusalem? The great number he met when he got there, and all of a sudden he's by himself. 
His purpose in the spirit to go on to Rome after a brief stopover in Jerusalem must have seemed like a, a fading, wishful dream. The Judaistic Jews hated him, and as you'll discover, they're already planning the next day to meet and plot his murder. The Romans are no doubt a little bit wary of this aging, scarred, weak-sided Roman citizen, a tent-making Jewish Pharisee and devoted follower of Jesus Christ, the same Jesus Christ that Pontius Pilate had crucified almost 30 years ago. What's going on? Paul knew with absolute conviction the sovereign Lord God has everything under control. But this is not how he had envisioned it all unfolding. He would get to Jerusalem, he would give the gift, they'd have some great fellowship, and then he would head off with some guys and they would head over to Rome. He'd minister there, then maybe go on to Spain and other places. He had all kinds of great ideas about what he was going to do. You see it in his writings. And here he sits in the Roman barracks. And I love the way 23 and verse 11 begins. But... God hasn't forgotten Paul. God knows exactly what he's doing. But on the following night, the Lord stood near to him to encourage him. He commands him to take courage. He encourages him with the approval of his work. He promises him that there is yet more to do and say, God is not finished with him yet, not by far. How many of us have been in that position? How many of you are in that position? Never in a thousand years did we imagine this part of our lives happening, unfolding this way. A great job, great family, steady rise up the success letter, all going exactly according to our plans and our goals. And then a devastating piece of news, news forever changes everything. A call to your manager's office that you're no longer needed call to a doctor's office that something very serious has been found and the news is not good. A false charge of wrongdoing that destroys a reputation and a life, an unwanted, unplanned pregnancy, perhaps outside of marriage, a betrayal of trust from a friend, a family member, or a loved one, and the list of possibilities goes on and is endless. If you're in that position, I want you to know there is great and encouraging news to help you readjust your focus, to help you see your circumstances through God's eyes. And if you're not in that position yet, (laughs) I want you to know some things for the day when you are. I'll never forget standing outside of KC Bible Church with uh, Hev and the, the boys, and Brady would have been about this big. It was our first official Sunday service, and they took a picture, do you remember, and Forgetti, and we had that picture, and I thought, this is it, this is where I'm going to be for the rest of my life, and four and a half years later, we're in a meeting, and it was all closing down, and I never thought I'd be there, and there's great news, there's great news All through Paul's life and ministry, God's purposeful providence had been at work. Every event and circumstance he encountered into, excuse me, every event and circumstance he encountered, endured, or enjoyed had been God's precise, necessary provision to bring him a step closer to God's ultimate purpose for Paul, which is God's own glory and Paul's greater good. God's purposeful providence is at work in Paul's life and ministry, and you guessed it, God's purposeful providence is at work in our lives and our ministries just as much. So first, we need to understand what God's purposeful providence is. What is God's providence? That may be a term that's totally new to you, and the word literally means to provide what is necessary. Theologically, the meaning expands slightly to government and provision and preservation of God's people. The London Baptist Confession of Faith and Catechism, verse question 15 says, what are the God's works of providence? And the answer is given. God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, 
and powerful, preserving and governing of all his creatures and all their actions. London Baptist Confession of Faith itself in the modern English says it like this, God, the good creator's infinite power and wisdom to uphold, to direct, to arrange and govern all creatures and things from the greatest to the least by his perfectly wise and holy providence to the purpose for which they were created. God governs all things according to his infallible foreknowledge and the free and unchangeable counsel of his will. And God's providence leads to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, infinite goodness, and mercy. If you want to read that again, I'll give you a copy of it later. Just ask me. God is sovereignly in control, working everything together as his purposeful provision of exactly what is needed to bring about his purposes for our good and his glory. I'm sure that's rocking some of your worlds to think about that. Uh, R.C. Sproul said it something like this. I'm told I misquote him, but... It's something like there's no random molecules in all of existence. Spurgeon said, not even the tiniest speck of dust is outside of God's plan and purpose. God is sovereignly in control, working everything together as his purposeful provision of exactly what is needed to bring about his purposes for his glory and our good. It's displayed all through scripture. In Psalm 135 and verse 6, the Bible says, Whatever the Lord pleases, He does. In heaven, in earth, in the seas, in all the deeps. What do we pray? Your will be done on earth as in heaven. We're praying for God to do what He promised and says He's going to do. Psalm 147 verses 8 to 9, the Bible says that God who covers the heavens with clouds, who provides rain for the earth and makes grass to grow on the mountains and gives to the beast its food. Jesus talked about the sparrows that fall, the number of the hairs in our head. That's all part of God's providence, God's preserving and governing of all his his creation. In Isaiah 46 verses 9 to 11, uh, God says, I am God. God, and there is no other. I am God, and there's no one like me, praise the Lord, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly, I've spoken Truly, I will bring it to pass. I've planned it. Surely, I will do it. God has everything, everything under control. Even Paul sitting in a Roman barracks wondering what would become of all his plans. He purposed in the spirit to go to Rome. How is it going to happen? Now, God was at work, and we're going to see it. Jonah 1, verse 17, this is a great statement in, in Jonah, three of them. The Lord appointed or provided a great fish to come up and swallow Jonah. In Jonah 4, verse 6, the Lord God appointed or provided a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head. But in verse 7, God appointed or provided a worm to come along when dawn came, attack the plant, and the plant withers. God's behind it all. He knows what he's doing. In Hebrews 1 verse 3, the Bible says that the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. Oh, beloved, stop and think about that. Switch me off for 30 seconds. Open your Bibles to Hebrews 1 verse 3 and just let that, your mind soak into that phrase. He upholds everything. Not because he's strong or, you know, fit and robust. The word of his power upholds and controls everything. In Job 1 verse 21, this is more the reaction to providence. In Job chapter 1 verse 21, after hearing of his oxen and donkey being stolen and God's fire falling and burning up all his sheep and servants and Chaldeans stealing his camels and killing his servants, 
and a great wind blowing on the four corners of the house, killing his sons and daughters as it collapsed. Inspired by God, Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He understood the providence of God. God's purposeful providence behind everything that happens, he saw it and he worshiped. In every one of those verses, God's providence is purposeful. God has a goal in mind in everything he does. His goal is the glory of his name and the good of his people, which is why for me the best text to ex- des- describe and explain God's providence is Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. I, I, I hope I don't commit heresy here, but I think I could t- safely say, and we know that God provides all things to work together for good. It's the same idea in the word. Sorry, same idea in the verse, not the word specifically. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called called according to his purpose. God doesn't randomly govern according to a shifting and undefined end goal. God has the glory of his name and the furtherance of the gospel and the good of his people in mind. He purposely provides what is needed. That's providence. So you say, how does it work in our text? In Paul's days in Jerusalem, God purposely provided the Asian Jews in the temple to make the wrong assumption, drag him out, and start beating him. And God purposely provided the watching Romans to come down just at the right time to rescue Paul. God purposely provided the ugly encounter and dissension within the Jewish council to keep Paul safely inside the Roman barracks. God purposely provided the rescue from Jewish murderers through Paul's nephew. I love that story. Isn't it great? They meet conspiring together in the dark of the night. We're going to do this and we're going to do that. And it just so happened that Paul's nephew heard about the whole thing. And we say, oh, isn't that great? Just so coincidental. Wrong. Wrong. A thousand times wrong. God purposely allowed Paul's nephew, a little boy, to hear the news and bring it to Paul. And Paul to send him to the commander. And the commander to prepare. Uh, he got a little group together to protect Paul. 470 people to 40 Jews to protect Paul. That's God's providence at work. That's God watching over his creatures, knowing exactly what he was doing. To use a little boy who faithfully told the story of what he'd heard to save Paul. God is at work, brother and sister, in your life. God is at work through the little things and the big things. God is at work. God purposely provided chains and captivity for Paul so that he could make repeated defenses and proclamations of the gospel before the governor Felix and his wife Drusilla, before Festus the next governor, before King Agrippa and his wife Bernice, before all the soldiers who were guarding him, and finally he stood before the most powerful man in that world, Caesar himself, and made a declaration and a defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What did Paul write in Philippians? Don't worry about my chains. This has all turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. By the time he wrote Philippians, he was understanding in full. God knew what he was doing. His plans had been sidetracked, but God's plan was carrying on unchecked and unwavering. Brother and sister in Christ, whatever you're going through, Whatever difficult problem you're encountering, I want you to understand and know God's providence is still at work. God has everything under control. Even in a cell in Rome, even in your situation, whatever the doctor has told you, God has it under control. Whatever your boss or your manager or your workmate has told you, God has it under control. Whatever devastating piece of news you've received recently, I assure you, God has it under control. Let's see some more. 
God purposely provided exactly what was needed to bring his purposes for Paul's life and ministry to the end goal for which he had created, saved, and was still sanctifying him back then. And now today, God is purposely, purposefully providing exactly what is needed to bring his purposes for our lives and ministry to the same end goal for which he created and saved and is sanctifying us, his glory and our good. God's not merely accomplishing great purposes around us and through us and in spite of us. He doesn't treat us like expendable pawns on a chessboard. That's a mistaken, blasphemous view. God deeply loves and cares for us, and we see that in this text. God deals with us with great gentleness and great kindness and compassion with Paul in these verses because of his purposeful providences. Because I'm sure for Paul, and I'm sure for you this morning, if you're going through some tough times, and you're saying, God's in control of this? What are you, nuts? Debatable. How dare you tell me that God's in control of this? This is a difficult pill that I'm swallowing. This isn't some theological concept that you're talking about from behind a pulpit when you're doing everything's going well in your life. It's a bitter providence that I'm swallowing. That's a phrase coined by John Piper years ago. I heard it back in 1992 or something. It's right around the back of my head. The bitter providences of God. They're tough pills to swallow. A life-changing health diagnosis, a plan-shattering dismissal from our job, the collapse of our dreams and plans due to sickness, financial loss, the reality of Paul's continuing ministry does not completely remove the dull ache of his loneliness and isolation and the bruising of the beating he'd already received. The Lord brings tremendous encouragement for bitter providences. In these moments, the Lord knows that we need his encouragement to endure those bitter providences. Notice finally verse 11 of Acts 23. He stands near him and says, be courageous. Other versions say, take courage. Notice first of all the encouragement of the Lord's presence. We see the Lord's presence with Paul, near him, uh, close to him. I love that Luke describes the Lord's coming and standing near. Not before, not above, not behind. The idea is beside him. Uncle Jack used to say, you know, there are times in our lives, Nelson, we come alongside people and we just stand beside them and we just reach over and put our arm around their shoulders and let them know that they're not alone. And in this moment, you can see that. He comes near to stand beside Paul to encourage him with his presence. That's friendship. That's fellowship and companionship. That's a powerful reminder that while God purposely provides bitter circumstances that he uses to conform us to Christ, he also in loving, compassionate shepherd care comes near to encourage us, help us, and strengthen us. And I would argue, brother and sister, in those times when the providences of God are bitter, those are the times when we know and we feel his presence so much deeper than in other times. Psalm 23, that beautiful old psalm, he got, it just hit me yesterday afternoon in there studying. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He guides He's the one leading the way in that verse. Next verse, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Did you get that? The Lord guides us and brings us into the valley of bitterness. Never once stepping away, not leaving us, but standing right beside us and going through those moments with us. The Lord leads us and guides us. He walks with us to comfort and strengthen us, as the psalmist said. In Psalm 46, verses 1 to 3, the psalmist writes, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. I thought, you know what, interesting? Habakkuk 3, 
though the fig tree doesn't blossom, though the, the, the vine doesn't grow, though the corn fails, though the, you know, the, all the things that go wrong, though all those things happen, we will trust in the Lord. That's what Habakkuk said. And in fact, this is what the psalmist is saying here in Psalm 46. Though the earth should change, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, we will not fear in the midst of bitter providences because the Lord is with us to help us. And sometimes, like a wise father, he comes alongside and doesn't get us out of those bitter providences. He just holds our hand as we go through them. And Paul, that night, I'm sure because of what the Lord says to him, his courage was failing. There was doubts rising up in his mind. And so the Lord, but on the following night, the Lord stood near him and said, be courageous. Take courage, Paul. In Acts 18, verses 9 and 10, it's the same idea again. The Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, don't be afraid any longer. He's in Corinth. He says, but go on speaking and do not be silent. Why? I'm with you. I'm standing beside you. I'll walk this road with you. Genesis 26 to, and verse 3 to Abraham, God says, sojourn in this land and I will be with you and bless you. In Exodus 3, verse 12, God says to Moses, certainly I will be with you as you go through this terrible job of getting this rebellious group of Israelites and leading them out of Egypt and, and tolerating their constant bickering and complaining and whinging and whining all the way through those desert years. And God says, I'll be with you. To Joshua, he says, no man will stand before you all the days of your life, just as I have been with Moses. I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. Listen, Christian, that wasn't written just for Joshua's sake. It was written for our sake also. Whatever you're going through, and I don't know every one of your circumstances and situations, but I'll tell you this much. Sometimes sermons come like, you know, fighting, like Jacob wrestling all night with God in prayer. And sometimes I open a passage and the, the outline just leaps off the page. And something tells me that this came so quickly and I had time to think about it all week. It makes me think that somebody here or somebody listening on that video is going through a terribly difficult time and they need to hear this. That's why I'm preaching it with all my might. God's with you. He's present. He hasn't left you. He hasn't forgotten about you. Isaiah 41 and verse 10 to the servant of the Lord, Isaiah writes, Do not fear, for I am with you. God is speaking. I'm with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's a promise not just for the servant of the Lord, but for the servants of the servant of the Lord, which is us. So there's encouragement in the Lord's presence. There's also encouragement in the Lord's command. His command is take courage. You know the greatest thing about God's commands and you read them in Scripture? God's commands imparts the strength to obey. It's like a father that says to his little child, who here has raised little kids and taught them how to walk? You can put your hand up. It's okay. Hey, isn't it great, right? You get the little guy up on his feet, and he's standing there, and you know, everything's like, you know, like he's drunk almost. And, and you're holding him by his fingers, and you slowly pull one hand out, and you sort of step back, and you're kind of going, come on, come on, come on. And, and you let go for maybe two seconds, and the little hands are like waving around. And, and, and as he takes a step forward, you kind of grab his hands. And, and in a sense, you're saying, come on, come on, walk the daddy, walk the daddy. And the little guy, on his face, right, and quickly. But our hands are right there. We're getting ready to grab him. We know it's not going to hurt him. We're right there. And the command to walk to daddy, when God gives it, gives the strength to obey. So when God says, the Lord says to Paul, be courageous, take courage. His very words communicate the strength for Paul to take that courage. But he gives him reasons why. He gives him two of them. First of all, Paul had spoken the truth about the Lord Jesus. Paul had been faithful to the Lord. 
Despite the resistant, persistent disbelief of the Jews, his captivity in the Roman barracks, his receiving of such a violent rejection, it was not God's judgment on him for wrongdoing. In fact, it was the expected outcome of faithful, truthful testimony to Christ. If they're beating us up for our witness, it's not because we're doing wrong, it's because we're doing right. If the bitter providences that you're experiencing are the result of a faithful testimony for Christ, Paul's message from the Lord is for you. Be encouraged. Take courage, Christian. Secondly, God's promise of future work. God is not finished with Paul yet. God is not sidelining, benching him, putting him out to pasture. God still has a great work for Paul to do. God's purposeful providing of his bitter arrest and captivity is part of God's far greater purpose to bring Paul in chains before many soldiers to testify to the truth about the Lord Jesus. He'll bring him before governors and kings to testify to the truth. And before the most powerful man in the world, he'll stand to make a testimony for the truth. Listen. The bitter providences of God that you may be enduring are not necessarily God's closing of your ministry. To use the overused and corny old saying, the Lord closes some doors to open others. It's corny, but it's true. The Lord's encouragement in the face of bitter providences, I'm with you. I have not finished with you. I have a work to do for you to do even yet. You will, you must testify before me, about me, sorry, in Rome. You want some more great reasons to take courage? Yeah, sure we do. Here's a couple. Matthew 9, verse 2. They brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. You want to talk about bitter providences? That's a bitter providence paralyzed. Everything that he needed done, someone else had to do for him. He couldn't even bring himself to Jesus. Four men had to carry him on a bed. As the story goes, they dug a hole through the ceiling and lowered him down. That's a bitter providence. And what does Jesus say? Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. If you're a Christian enduring the bitter providences of God, you can take great courage this morning because your sins are forgiven. I don't know who it was sharing a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the evening services. If God had saved me and made me stand in the corner for the rest of my life, not talking to anybody, it would have been enough because he saved me. If God saves you, and then allows you in, to endure bitter, bitter providences. I, I keep thinking of Johnny Erickson Tata, right? Paralyzed in a wheelchair, tremendous ministry, all the rest of it. She was a gymnast and an acrobat, did all kinds of fancy things, the old pictures of her. Now she sits in a wheelchair and she thanks God for that wheelchair. It's a bitter providence. But God was gracious to her. God was kind to her. Her sins were forgiven. Take courage. Whatever you're going through, take courage. Your sins are forgiven. It's right with God. There's going to come a day when all these circumstances will be pushed away and we'll be with the Lord Jesus Christ, made perfect and whole before him. Take courage. Matthew 14, 26 and 27, disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea and they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I. Literally, take courage, I am. And he may pronounce God's name across the waters. And you know what that, you, what that tells me? When the storm, the rocking, rolling, raging storm that you're in because of whatever circumstances you're in is there, take courage because Jesus is nearby. Take courage. He is part of that storm. Take courage. It's when the storm happens that he draws near. He's not left us. He is with us. Last one. John 16, 33. 
These things I've spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I've overcome the world in the midst of bitter providences of God, of living in an ungodly, depraved, and wicked culture and society. We take great courage in this. Christ has overcome the world. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. It is his now. We can take courage in that. Whatever this world may do to us, our master and our Lord has overcome it. Thirdly, encouragement in the Lord's deliverance. Well, we spent 40 minutes to get through the first verse out of 25. The rest of the story is God's marvelous deliverance of Paul from the murderous plot of the 40 fanatics. We see why God's purposely provided Paul's arrest and captivity, once in chains, now free with him, soon to return to chains. It's so that God may purposefully place Paul in front of governors and kings and Caesar to testify to the gospel. In this story, we see the purposeful providence of God again. Forty fanatics take counsel to murder him. If slapping Paul in the face on that yesterday wasn't enough law-breaking, now they plot to murder him in defiance of God's law. And he saw Paul's nephew. All that was part of God's purposeful plan to deliver Paul into the arena where he have two more years to make the gospel known. At, just at Caesarea, never mind in, in Rome. Beloved, God does deliver us from bitter providences. And when that deliverance is part of his continued purpose for our good and his glory. But sometimes he simply provides sufficient grace to endure those providences, knowing they're for our good and his glory. And there is so much more I want to say about our being satisfied in God's bitter providences, but we just don't have time. So what I want to do as we wrap up, is this. What do we do with all this? For those who are enduring those bitter providences of God, whatever they are, trust the Lord. It's, you say, that's such a simple thing to say. You're right, it is. But in those moments when God strips away all of the other supports we gather around ourselves, and all we have left is Him and Him alone, to endure those bitter providences, the one call we make is trust the Lord. He has everything under control. Remember his promise of walking with us through the valley of bitterness, his drawing near to us in those moments. Lean into him. Draw close to him. Do not allow, and this is the danger, do not allow those bitter providences to push you away from Christ. Have I ever told you a story of Daryl Gilliard? Does anybody here know the story of Daryl Gilliard? No? Never heard that story? Oh, it's a great story. Um, heard it years ago in an American evangelical TV program. This young uh, black fella, uh, he was um, abandoned, I think, and picked up by a lady who looked after foster kids. And she was poor as poor, and she had five or six or more foster kids in her care. And the only thing that she could do for little Daryl was every day she would, she would pull him close with all the rest of the kids. And she would read stories from a battered, torn old Bible. And she told him the story of the Lord Jesus. One day that dear old lady got sick and she was no longer able to care for all those kids. And so all the kids got parceled out to one direction or another. And finally Daryl was left and there was nowhere for him to go. And he wound up living under a bridge surviving on whatever he could scrounge up. And he walked out to at the end of the pier one night and he said, Lord, what are you doing? I got nothing. He managed to hang on to her tattered little Bible that she had. And he said, the Lord spoke to him, not an audible voice, but the Lord spoke to him and gave him this one simple message. I have everything under control. Trust me. And so Daryl Gilliard decided that he was going to trust the Lord. And he went to school. He graduated the top of his class in high school. He went to Bible school. He got a degree. And then he resolved to serve the Lord for the rest of his life. And he wound up planting a church in, if you know America at all, 
the central part of Florida, and you go down the Florida Peninsula, the central part is it, back in the 70s and 80s was one of the worst, yeah, you know, worst black-white tension areas. Clear, hard lines of division. I drove through there in 1992 with a friend of mine, and the, the old scenes of the elderly black gentleman rocking on the porch in a little tiny shack, and my friend said, don't laugh, but in that shack there's probably 20 people living in a space that's about a quarter the size of this room. And he decided, by God's help, I'm going to plant a 50% black and a 50% white church in the worst of the neighborhoods. And by God's grace, he did. And his message from God through all of that was, trust me, I've got everything under control. When the bottom drops out, God is still in control. When things don't work out the way we want to or we plan or we foresee, God has everything under control. We trust him. But beloved, I can't finish this sermon without describing God's greatest provision because providence, as we said, is God's purposeful provision for our greatest need. And you all know where we're going now. What is God's greatest provision for our greatest need? And of course, we know it is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We who were created by God, who is most holy, most wise, all-powerful, all-knowing, and unchanging, he created us to glorify him through faith and obedience to him and his word. But we've all gone astray. Every last one of us, part of those bitter providences are because of the consequences of sin we've committed, right? But God's providence is so much greater than our sin. We've all gone astray. We've all gone our own way. We've all sinned against God and broken his law, crossed his boundaries. We've failed to meet his standards of sinless perfection. We have all, every last one of us, been declared guilty and condemned to an eternal death separated from God. As we are in our situation, we have absolutely no hope but God. Because of his great mercy and his measureless grace and kindness, the same mercy and kindness we see in his coming to Paul, he displayed mercy to us, but not an unjust mercy, a mercy according to absolute justice. He sent Christ, his one, only, unique, sinless son, truly God and truly man. God purposefully provided Jesus Christ as our Savior. God purposely provided exactly what we needed. A suffering servant Savior who, and this hit me last night too, who endured the bitterest providence of all. I had to go to the dentist twice, no, three, four times in the last couple of weeks. And they pull out that needle, you know, it's about that long, it's about that thick. And they bring it over to your mouth, and they start to slide that thing down there, and I can feel my toes getting pinked, pricked. You know what I do? I, I'm not, it's not a joke. I'm, I'm serious. What I do is I'm laying there. I think to myself, my Lord Jesus endured the equivalent of a seven-inch nail being driven through his hands. And both of them and his feet. My Lord endured pain unlike anything I could possibly imagine. He didn't endure it because he hadn't brushed his teeth enough. He endured it because we had all sinned against the living God. He endured the bitterest providence of them all. He entered the body that was provided for him that he may be truly man, experiencing all the weaknesses of man and yet truly God. He endured the scourge that was provided for him that by his stripes we may be healed. He endured the cross that was provided for him that by his suffering and death our sin might be propitiated. God might be satisfied in his anger against us. He endured the abandonment of God that was provided for him that we might be reconciled to God. He endured the grave that was provided for him that we might never know eternal death, but that we might live through him. 
He suffered God's bitterest providence of all in order to bring us all to the end goal for which we were created, the praise of the glory of his grace. That's why you were created. He provided for our greatest need, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he calls us to trust in him, to believe the gospel, to turn away from sin and turn toward God, and everything will be great in your life from that point onwards, right? Right? No, that's a lie. More than likely, your life will become much more difficult and you will endure some bitter providences as you turn away from sin and turn toward God, but you'll endure them in the great hope, the great hope of an eternal salvation, an eternal relationship with the living God. What a great God we have. Would you stand with me? We're going to pray and then we'll sing the benediction. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we give thanks again this morning for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, you called us this morning to come together to worship a God who is absolutely holy. And we would declare with the angels, holy, holy, holy. And Father, immediately you were reminded that we were, we are sinners. We're saved by grace. Father, we recognize immediately that, that there's nothing of ourselves that gives us the right to be here, but that you called us and saved us and washed us and are bringing us to yourself. Father, for the bitter providences that some of us are enduring this morning, oh God, I cry out to you, give that one, those two, three, four, whatever it is, great strength, great courage to endure, to keep going, knowing that you are with them knowing that you have not left and never will. Father, we give thanks that you guide us in paths of righteousness, and those paths include the valleys of bitterness, but that you have a great purpose in it all. Father, we thank you most of all for the Lord Jesus Christ, who endured the bitterest providence of all, to take on flesh and blood, to live and walk in this earth, to endure the mocks and taunts and abuse of his own creation, to give the soldiers the strength they needed as they lifted the hammer to drive the nails through his hands and feet. Who endured the providence of your abandonment for a time that we might be reconciled for eternity. Oh God, we would give thanks. We praise you, O God, from the bottom of our hearts for such a great salvation, such a great Savior. And we give thanks in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.